On October 7, 2001, NATO began its invasion of Afghanistan. Ten years later, as the country descends into even greater chaos, the illegal occupation of Afghanistan continues. Welcome. This is James Corbett of Global Research TV at grtv.ca. October 7th marks the 10-year anniversary of the commencement of NATO operations in Afghanistan. Although the impending illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003 was enough to drive millions of people worldwide into the streets in protest, there has never been the same widespread resistance to the Afghan war. This war has been deemed the right war and given a broad measure of support from across the political spectrum because it is still linked in the popular imagination with the events of 9-11. Even a cursory interrogation of these assumptions, however, reveals the absurd nature of this pretext for what has been all along an illegal invasion and occupation of a sovereign nation. On the evening of 9-11, the North Atlantic Council issued a statement offering the assistance of all 18 NATO member states to the United States, calling the attacks without precedent in the modern era. The next day, the Council met again, making the extraordinary decision to invoke Article 5 of the Washington Treaty for the first time in NATO's history. On September the 12th, the North Atlantic Council met again in response to the appalling attacks perpetrated yesterday against the United States of America. The Council agreed that if it, is, if it is determined that this attack was directed from abroad against the United States, it shall be regarded as an action covered by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which states that an armed attack against one or more of the Allies in Europe or in North America shall be considered an attack against them all. The carefully worded statement contained the important stipulation that Article 5 would only apply if it could be determined that the attacks were directed from abroad, something that NATO Secretary General Robertson noted had not been determined. Now, I did not say the attack came from abroad. If I can repeat what I said, the Council agreed that if it, if it is determined that this attack was directed from abroad against the United States, it shall be regarded as an action covered by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. The United States is still assessing the evidence that is available. Uh, they are the ones who obviously uh, can make that judgment, and they have not yet reached a judgment as to who did it and why they did it. On October 2nd, the Council met again to announce that they had dropped the word if from their previous declaration on the basis of a report issued by a U.S. State Department official named Frank Taylor. Today's was a classified briefing, so I cannot give you all the details. Briefings are also being given directly by the United States to allies in their capitals. The briefing addressed the events of 11th September themselves, the results of the investigation so far, what is known about Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda organization and their involvement in the attacks and in previous terrorist activity, and the links between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The facts are clear and compelling. The information presented points conclusively to an Al-Qaeda role in the 11th of September attacks. To this day, the evidence presented in Frank Taylor's briefing is still classified, and the evidence that Secretary General Robertson called clear and compelling information pointing conclusively to an Al-Qaeda role in 9-11 has never been made public. Nor was this evidence ever presented to the FBI, who told investigative journalist Ed Haas in 2006 that there was no hard evidence linking Osama to 9-11. As the documentary record shows, the lip service paid to finding Osama was never more than a convenient excuse for the Afghan invasion. In February of 2001, the Taliban offered to turn bin Laden over to the United States, but the U.S. refused. The Taliban. In Afghanistan, they have offered that they are ready to hand over Osman bin Laden to Saudi Arabia if the United States drops its uh, sanctions and uh, other, uh, they have uh, some kind of deal that they want to make with the United States. So you have any comments? If, uh, uh, let me take that and get back to you on that. The offer was repeated in October of 2001, shortly after the bombing started, but again, the U.S. rejected it. Bin Laden himself was not even in Afghanistan at the time of the 9-11 attacks, a point later confirmed by CBS News. CBS News has been told that the night before the September 11th terrorist attack, Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. 
he was getting medical treatment with the support of the very military that days later pledged its backing for the U.S. war on terror in Afghanistan. Pakistan intelligence sources tell CBS News that bin Laden was spirited into this military hospital in Rawalpindi for kidney dialysis treatment. Eventually, all pretense was dropped that the invasion of Afghanistan had anything to do with finding Osama bin Laden. So I, I don't know where he is. Nor do, you know, I, I just don't spend that much time on him, I'll be honest with you. The mystery of this non-pretext for the Afghan invasion, however, makes perfect sense, not if one sees the invasion as retaliation for 9-11, but exactly the opposite, if one understands 9-11 as in fact the pretext for a previously planned military operation to fulfill previously acknowledged Western geostrategic imperatives. As National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter, Zbigniew Brzezinski oversaw Operation Cyclone, a covert U.S. plan for luring the Soviet Union into an unwinnable war in Afghanistan by first fomenting and then actively supporting Islamic fundamentalists in the country. This became the basis for the eventual takeover of the country by the Taliban with active CIA support through their front in the Pakistani intelligence services. In 1997, just four years before the NATO invasion, Brzezinski wrote that, For America, the chief geopolitical prize is Eurasia. Now a non-Eurasian power is preeminent in Eurasia, and America's global primacy is directly dependent on how long and how effectively its preponderance on the Eurasian continent is sustained. He pinpointed what he called the Eurasian Balkans, an area encompassing Afghanistan and its neighbors, as the most geopolitically significant region to control for its gas and oil reserves and mineral deposits. Later that year, a senior delegation from the Taliban came to the United States for meetings with UNICAL about securing the rights to construct a gas pipeline from Turkmenistan to Pakistan across Afghanistan. In 2002, it was revealed that the United States had been negotiating with the Taliban to secure those oil interests, and that American negotiators had told the Taliban that they had a choice. You have a carpet of gold, meaning an oil deal, or a carpet of bombs. Shortly after the 9-11 attacks, a former Pakistani foreign secretary revealed to the BBC that a senior American official had told him in mid-July of 2001 that military action against Afghanistan would go ahead by the middle of October. When the Bush administration came into office, its first substantive national security decision directive, NSPD-9, called for military options against Taliban targets in Afghanistan, including leadership, command control, air and air defense, ground forces, and logistics, and was presented to the president on September 4, 2001, seven days before 9-11. What makes the nightmare of this invasion all the more disturbing is that in allowing this invasion to go forward, and in offering no significant resistance to the operation itself, the public has effectively allowed the war criminals to set a series of disturbing precedents which future public political leaders have used and in the future will no doubt continue to use in justifying their own wars of conquest. Earlier this week, I talked to Rick Rosoff, director of Stop NATO International, about this very problem. Uh, what uh, the 10th anniversary of the U.S. and British attack on Afghanistan on October 7th, 2001, uh, brought in its train is, as you alluded to, you know, 10 years of uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, you know, coming in as camp followers initially and then taking over the operation uh, as, as they continued to manage it under the so-called International Security Assistance uh, Force, um, where, you know, probably 90% of foreign troops in Afghanistan currently are serving under NATO. That is, uh, in, you know, that includes, of course, the vast bulk of American troops. It's the largest number of American troops serving under NATO command in history. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, outdoes or outnumbers uh, the amount of American troops stationed in Bosnia in 1995. There were 60,000 troops under NATO command, and uh, in Kosovo in 1999, were 50,000 troops you know came in under NATO command. Uh, but there are a lot of other um, you know rather shocking uh, precedents about this. This is the longest war in the history of the United States. Uh, the longest continuous independent combat operations. It's uh, longer than that in Indochina, for example. It's the longest war in the history of Afghanistan. You know, Soviet troops first uh, came into Afghanistan in late December of 1979, 
and uh, the last ones were pulled out earlier, early in 1999. So far, less you know, less than a decade. Uh, it's the largest amount of foreign occupation and combat troops stationed in Afghanistan in that nation's history. Um, a few months ago, the the total number is in the area of 152,000 all but perhaps 10,000 under NATO command, under ISAF command. Uh, it is NATO's first war in Asia. It is NATO's first ground war. It signifies with anywhere from 4,500 to 5,300 German troops stationed in uh, Kunduz province in the north of Afghanistan, uh, the uh, largest overseas deployment of German troops since World War II. The first combat operations uh, waged by German ground forces since uh, the Hitler regime. Uh, with four provinces in the north of Afghanistan uh, assigned by ISAF, by NATO, to uh, NATO partners Sweden and Finland. It represents, in the second case, uh, the first time Finland's been engaged in combat operations since World War II, and in the case of uh, Sweden, in two centuries. And one could go on uh, and on. Um, I would have to say, however, there was an article in Agence France uh, Press report of yesterday that mentioned that on the 10th anniversary of this war, and again, you know, the first uh, ground combat by German troops since the Third Reich, and what I've mentioned about the Scandinavian countries, you know, until recently, uh, uh, Bruit uh, boasted of being neutrals and so forth, that there were no major demonstrations planned in Europe to mark the 10th anniversary of this war. That is not only a scandal, that's a crime. <laughs> It, it, but it uh, testifies to how thoroughly uh, the entire European continent has been NATOized. As worrying as all of these precedents are in the wake of continued NATO aggression and domination in theaters like Libya, the Afghan people themselves continue to be the forgotten victims of this war. Punished for living within the borders of a country that was accused at one time of harboring someone who was alleged without proof to have been responsible for an act of terrorism which the majority of the people don't even know happened, the Afghans have watched as their cities, their towns, their infrastructure, and of course, their lives, have been destroyed by the NATO war machine. New violence in Afghanistan as tempers flare over an overnight NATO raid. Hundreds of men ran through the streets chanting insults against the U.S., Germany, and Afghan President Hamid Karzai. They carried the bodies of four people who were killed in the raid. Protesters claimed they were civilians. NATO confirms it killed four people, two of them women, but said all of them were armed and tried to fire on its troops. A Joint Base Lewis McCord soldier has been sentenced to three years behind bars for taking part in the so-called kill team against unarmed Afghan citizens. Another week, another statement of regret. NATO said it used airborne weapons to attack a convoy of what it thought were insurgents. But after the strike, ground forces arrived to find that among those killed and wounded were women and children. Violence is at its worst in Afghanistan since U.S.-backed Afghan forces toppled the Taliban in late 2001. Almost 390 foreign troops have been killed so far this year, compared with a record 711 in 2010 spike in casualties that comes at a time of growing unease about the increasingly unpopular and costly war. But it is the civilians who have borne the brunt of the war. UN figures show a record 1,462 Afghan civilians were killed in conflict-related incidents in the first six months of the year. As Michelle Shosodovsky of the Center for Research on Globalization told me earlier this week, the commencement of the NATO-led invasion of Afghanistan 10 years ago was by no means the commencement of the destruction of that country in the name of Western geopolitical strategy. In fact, as he argues, there has been a continuous interference in Afghan affairs since the commencement of Operation Cyclone under the Carter administration in 1979, a 32-year-long campaign against Afghanistan that amounts, in effect, to a coordinated policy of genocide against the Afghan people? I, I think we should put this in a historical context. This is not a 10th year anniversary of a war which started in 2001, as we are led to believe. 
It is a war which started in 1979. It's a 32-year-old U.S.-sponsored war. It was presented as the Soviet-Afghan war, but in fact we knew from the outset that the insurgency, the Mujahideen, were trained by the CIA and financed by the United States and, and Saudi Arabia, and that this was uh, it, it, the intent of this process was to destabilize a secular uh, government which in the post-colonial period had achieved significant um, development uh, objectives, uh, including rights of women. Um, and consequently, what happened was the development of an Islamic uh, insurgency with a view to toppling a secular government. That started in 79, and, the, and we had the whole period of the 1980s with the support of Pakistan. Um, the, the generals, the military government of Pakistan was behind it. Uh, Pakistan's inter-services intelligence was the relay of the United States uh, with a view to waging this, this, uh, this war uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, which was presented as a civil war when in fact it was a U.S.-sponsored war. Now, um, the Taliban, to cut short on the history, the Taliban were installed uh, in 1995-96. Uh, by the United States, uh, they were sponsored by the United States. The Taliban were the graduates of the Quranic schools, of the madrasas, which were set up with the support of the CIA, so that in effect this was a U.S. sponsored regime. But the Taliban also had their own agenda, uh, and they were acting perhaps too much sovereign in relation to what they were supposed to be, which was a puppet regime. Um, I should mention, and that's very important, that Afghanistan is the major and largest producer of grade 4 heroin in the world. It produces opium, uh, it produces more than 90 percent of the opium consumed worldwide. And we're talking about a multi-billion dollar operation of which very little actually trickles down to Afghanistan. So that there is a, there's a financial agenda behind this. There's masses of money to be made out of opium uh, and the sale of heroin throughout the world. Uh, there are various intermediaries, there are criminal syndicates, there are business syndicates. And all this is, of course, protected uh, by the U.S.-led occupation. And it's worth mentioning that immediately uh, after the invasion, on October 7, 2001, uh, the levels of um, opium production shot up. They had, in fact, been subjected to uh, a very significant um, um, drug eradication program by the Taliban government, which led to their collapse in the year 2000-2001. In fact, uh, opium production went down uh, to something of the all of 150 tons or 180 tons, and then it shot up immediately back to its historical levels uh, shortly after the invasion. Uh, so that there was a 90 percent drop in opium production, and immediately when the when um, U.S. and Allied troops came in, uh, opium production regained its historical levels. Um, if we look at the balance sheet of this country how it has been impoverished over a period of more than 30 years as a result of so-called civil wars, but U.S.-sponsored civil wars and U.S.-NATO-sponsored theater wars, we're, we're dealing with an issue of genocide uh, directed against an entire population. Ultimately, this genocidal campaign unmasks in the starkest terms the complete hubris of the Western imperialist enterprise. As Afghans continue to die, and attacks in the country continue to escalate, as an administration that gave lip service to ending the wars as a cynical campaign strategy then escalates in its involvement in that war and expands it into Pakistan, as a co-opted, establishment-supporting anti-war movement continues to tacitly support the massacre taking place in that country because it can't bring itself to question the pretext which was never even given for the slaughter, 
Those with the rationality to see this war for what it is are left to wonder what lessons can be learned from this 32-year-long deception, and whether, once tricked into going along with it, the public will ever wake up from the nightmare of this illegal occupation and bring itself to hold those criminal heads of state who brought it about responsible for their actions. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com.